Today, uh, we have a webinar which is uh, organized by the Center for Open Science. And the uh, contributions today come from um, uh, Jesper Schneider uh, from Aarhus University and Yuri Tiding from uh, Amsterdam Medical Centers. Um, Yuri and Jesper are both uh, working uh, uh, in our project Tier 2, which is a major easy uh, funded initiative uh, to uh, work uh, to boost knowledge, um, uh, both theoretical and empirical, um, as well as create new tools and practices, communities and capacity for increasing uh, the reproducibility um, of research where that's um, uh, a relevant aim. Um, I'll first introduce our speakers and then um, they will take the reins and basically each will present for 20 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for um, Q&A uh, after each presentation. There's the Q&A feature in Zoom, which I would um, uh, ask you all to use if you want to pose your questions. Um, and if, if we don't get to questions within the allotted time, um, uh, we'll try to answer questions also uh, live um, using the chat feature as well. So um, our, uh, our second speaker today will be Yuri Tidink, uh, who is Principal Investigator at the Ethics, Law and Humanities Department of the Amsterdam uh, University Medical Centers. His main research focuses on research integrity, reproducibility, mental health in academia, research culture, publication pressure, open science, the validity of uh, clinical trials and assessment of research and researchers. Jury is also a, a qualified and practicing uh, psychiatrist, which is, of course, helping us during our, our project. Um, uh, and he works as work package lead within the Tier 2 project. Uh, and Jesper Schneider um, is a meta-researcher, um, a professor at uh, Aarhus University in uh, Denmark, specializing in quantitative studies of science, research evaluation, sociology of science, research integrity, and statistics. Does research on research, study and practices, norms, methods, reporting, reproducibility, evaluation, and incentives. And uh, within tier two, Jesper, uh, along with his uh, very talented PhD student, Sven Ulps, is leading our work on the theory side of uh, reproducibility. And so Jesper will take the floor first uh, to present work uh, by him and Sven. Um, if you would like to share your uh, presentation, Jesper. Yes. Thanks, Tony. Then I will try to do that. Then. Then. So is that OK? Not yet. Uh, no. How about this one? No, now that's your desktop. Yes. Now? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. Go. Okay. I'll just remove that one. Fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to summarize some of the work that my colleague Sven Ulpst, uh, who is also here today and will help me answer questions afterwards, and I have been doing in Work Package 3, uh, Task 1 on the Tier 2 project. And it's, as you can see from the title, about definitions, relevance, and feasibility of reproducibility. Now, what's not to like about reproducibility? Well, according to Oxford Learner's Dictionary of Academic English, verbs like reproduce or replicate seems almost synonymous. To produce something again, that is reproduce, or to produce the same again, that is replicate, but then there is the copy thing linked to reproduce, and one could ask if copying is not the same as same. And there are, of course, a difference between the act or process, uh, doing or rather redoing something, and the adjective of reproducible, or for that matter, replicable, which hints at the possibility of enabling something to be redone. If we then look at it from a, sort of a real life or real academic life perspective, while the semantics are somewhat confusing, the intuitive understanding, at least in, uh, in the sciences, uh, is that 
to reproduce implies to be uh, scientific. A being reproducibly being reproducible means it's real. And this is an epistemic norm and perhaps also a demarcation, at least for dominant paradigms in the sciences. And uh, this epistemic norm also seems to, to be an aim for parts of the open science reform movement. Yeah. So our task, our main task uh, in, in tier two, work package uh, three, task one, is to try and get a grip on reproducibility and provide some kind of conceptual framework that acknowledges epistemic diversity, as well as the intrinsic complexities of reproducibility across diverse kinds of research and research context. Now, a point of departure were the apparent terminological confusion that I was referring to, uh, but also an impression that discussions of reproducibility tend to be rather one-sided and a genuine concern on our part about a one-size-fits-all solution for an epistemic norm on reproducibility. And we have approached this through two tasks or subtasks, uh, a conceptual analysis and an attempt at developing a conceptual framework. Um, it is no secret that, oops, oh, I got a, yeah, right. Well, it's no secret that there is a conceptual confusion, uh, which is quite immense in the literature, both within and across disciplines. Uh, you could say at the aggregate conceptual level when it comes to reproducibility or replicability or repeatability and other related terms as well as the as their derivatives, and also at the disaggregate level where you have the qualifiers which are attached to the aggregate level of concept, there you can also see a whole plethora of these uh, qualif qualifiers. And what you, the impression you get from this is, of course, that there are uh, different terms that mean the same and the same terms that mean completely different things. In, our, in other words, there is no unified understanding uh, of this. If we uh, then look, of, if we further look at how purposes of reproducibility of replication is summarized in the literature, it becomes clear from our review that they are too narrow and does not really acknowledge the almost infinite number of purposes identifiable in the literature. The complexity or diversity is set aside, probably because such summaries or taxonomies have normative aims rather than descriptive ones. And you could also see that a related problem with such narrow taxonomies is that, that many purposes will fit poorly to the few derived categories in this example, and this is just one example uh, 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 here, you can see uh, many of these different purposes has to fit in with the reliability and validity uh, uh, purposes derived in the table. This matrix by Gunderson, uh, to some extent, actually illustrates the manifold parts of what can be replicated or reproduced, as well as showing how these parts can be kept the same similar, different, uh, or not specified at all, between the original and the reproducibility experiments. In other words, Gunderson illustrates the huge potential variability in the practices of reproducibility. And this study only maps a small portion of the literature he reviewed where these practices are suggested. There are actually many more. So, in characterizing types of reproducibility, we believe that proposing long enumerative lists with idiosyncratic definitions and an extensive list of qualifiers does not really add merit to our descriptive purposes. We therefore suggest a more open and bottom-up approach where identified purposes are mapped to identified practices uh, and which can be maintained and extended like, a, uh, uh, like an asymmetrical matrix. Now, consequently, our conceptual analysis across all fields reveal that the terminology surrounding reproducibility is even more complex, uh, complex, conflated and confused than we anticipated to begin with. We also came to the conclusion that another attempt at, at this broad new definition based on the current confused terminology and its many qualifiers would be futile. 
Instead, we found it more fruitful to map the intended purposes with the actual practice to clarify what type of reproducibility or replication we are actually talking about. So the concept of the reproducibility is complex in itself, but we also need to link it to the notion of epistemic diversity. Just to mention a few important claims in this regard, Peels and Bauter argue for the possibility and desirability of replication and replicability in the humanities. Leonelli claims that different kinds of research relate differently to notions of reproducibility, making reproducibility as a universal epistemic criterion problematic. Penders, Holbrook and De Reiche extend this and point towards important differences in ways of knowing between humanities and the sciences leading to potential dangers of universal reproducibility norms. Guttinger names these discussions the new localism, highlighting how reproducibility and replication issues are dependent on local conditions. And finally, Haig focuses on the diversity in psychological science and his view that the resulting, uh, in, in his view, this should result in, in a smaller role for replication that is gener than is generally claimed by many open, in the open science reforms. So why does this matter? Well, due to the conceptual confusion, it can be practically meaningless or even misleading to speak of the importance or relevance of reproducibility for research without specifying what is meant by practices and intended purposes. And in this context, and in the context of epistemic diversity, such confusing is also problematic because different kinds of research and research concepts relate quite differently to the notions of reproducibility, if at all. Epistemic diversity, therefore, adds an additional layer of complexity. Hence, we have two interrelated complexities to deal with. The way we approached this in our development of the conceptual framework was to situate reproducibility within the epistemic social and contextual conditions of knowledge production. When examining the literature, uh, uh, reproducibility is most often addressed from one disciplinary perspective, for example, philosophy of science or sociology of science, two fields which generally have a hard time talking to each other, and we find this uh, wanting. To us, it is very important to acknowledge both the epistemic and the social conditions that determine knowledge production, and obviously also the specific contextual conditions that put boundaries and restrictions on specific modes of knowledge production. So we produ produce knowledge production modes as our organizing construct, but what is knowledge production modes then? Consider this synoptic view by Leo Nelly. It is very interesting and brings forward some important aspects in relation to knowledge production, such as the types of research, degree of control, reliance on statistics as an inferential tool, but for our purposes, such an enumerative top-down classification is too exclusive, inflexible, and also too simplistic. Indeed, the aspects or dimensions themselves seem challenging when mapped to the so-called types of research. Consider, for instance, high-energy physics, which would be classified with standardized experiments together with clinical trials. Such fields seemingly have very high degree on control of the experiment and high degree on reliance on statistical um, um, uh, infer uh, statistics as an inferential tool. Whoops, I just need to hear. Yeah. In our view, however, knowledge production in these two fields are actually quite different, especially when it comes to control and reliance on statistics. And this has consequences for what we call the feasibility of reproducibility and what we can expect in relation to outcomes. As a consequence, we need more fine-grained aspects or dimensions in order to characterize knowledge production. And further, we also think that fields or disciplines are not necessarily the most optimal units of analysis when it comes to organizing similar knowledge production. Because the same fields can have different ways of organizing knowledge production and same fields can have different ways of knowing. Again, this has consequences for the relevance and feasibility of reproducibility for the ability for the specific knowledge production mode we are examining. Consider the field of international relations within social sciences. Here we have at least two distinct ways of knowing, a positivist and an interpretivist school. Clearly these schools approach and value research very differently. However, not necessarily according to method as we would find both quantitative and qualitative approaches among the positivists. 
So while positivists would generally agree on epistemic norms, they would still have different, perhaps somewhat overlapping knowledge production modes due to their varying social and contextual conditions. In other words, the feasibility of reproducibility will be different for such knowledge production modes, even though they will both acknowledge it, acknowledge it as an epistemic norm. Consequently, contrary to others, we do not think fields or methods are good units of analysis when it comes to examining the relevance and the feasibility of reproducibility. Hence, we propose this disaggregate construct of knowledge production modes. Now, consequently, our conceptual approach situates reproducibility within the epistemic, social and contextual conditions of knowledge production. For pragmatic reasons, we speak of redoing or enabling. Redoing is the act, a process of redoing something, which basically could be reproducibility or replication. Enabling refers to enable others to redo something or enable into subjectivity or traceability of what is reported. In other words, transparency of some kind. To clarify the practices and purposes of redoing or enabling for different kinds of research in varying, in varying research contexts, two main dimensions are needed to examine relevance or redoing and feasibility of redoing and in, uh, enabling. This distinction is crucial because even for research where specific types of redoing might be relevant, it can still be unfeasible. Of course, feasibility and relevance comes in degrees. And how do we determine relevance then? Well, two main as uh, aspects or dimensions are useful. Research goals and epistemology. Research goal could be whether there are um, commercial or proprietary interest uh, presenting a conflict, whereas epistemology is the basic assumption behind knowledge production modes. It determines and justifies knowledge claims. It determines the so-called system of justification, which is the criteria for good, trusty research and what are the established practices to demonstrate them within specific knowledge production modes, and as such, determine quality criteria and epistemic norms. Different ways of knowing have different epistemic norms, and for some ways of knowing, redoing will, will not be relevant as an epistemic norm. However, while redoing might be relevant, the feasibility of redoing, for example, an experiment may vary considerably according to the, no, to the knowledge production mode. When it comes to examining feasibility, we currently propose three overall dimensions. The complexity of the subject under the investigation, the necessary investment for redoing, that is resource dependency and availability of the resources to the researchers, and as well as how much uncertainty is associated with the research, both theoretically and methodically. And like Richard Ridley's approach to characterizing scientific fields, most of this can actually be characterized as either high or low, as shown on the, my right of the, of the screen. Hence, our framework as it stands right now can be illustrated as this. We have a conceptual part that maps intended purposes to actual practices, and a part that assesses to what extent redoing is relevant and to what extent redoing is actually feasible. Um, notice, if redoing is not relevant, perhaps enabling is relevant. And if enabling is relevant, its feasibility may vary as well. But we have not addressed the enabling part in this talk, but it's also included in the framework. Notice, the degree of feasibility will also indicate what we should expect from redoing something what the outcome, what we should expect from the outcome. We think this bottom-up approach may have the potential to be more inclusive. And we think it is important to have the epistemological dimensions including in order to examine the underlying assumptions of knowledge production modes and therefore also the potential relevance of redoing. So to wrap up, to navigate through and escape the conceptual confusion surrounding the reproducibility and replication terminology, we suggest the distinction between practices and purposes of redoing and enabling. Stakeholders should make careful considerations if they think about incentivizing or even require reproducibility where it is potentially not relevant and or feasible. And we would also like to warn or notice that we don't intend to provide some kind of checklist or cookbook. Instead, we want to encourage and aid thinking and diversity. We think the framework suggests what needs to be taken into consideration to acknowledge the complexities associated with reproducibility, as well as the realities of epistemic diversity. 
And as you can see here, there is a link to uh, some of our papers and, and po uh, uh, policy briefs uh, on the tier two website. Here are the references pointed to. And on behalf of Sven and myself, many thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Jesper. Um, uh, a silent round of applause. Um, so we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I think Sven is available also to uh, to help take questions. Um, I'll just go uh, start going through those that are in the Q and A at the moment. Um, and please do, if you uh, if anybody wants to raise a question, just write it into the Q and A, and we can address it then. Um, so maybe I can start with a question by uh, Isatu Saar, uh, Yesman Sven. Um, this was posted maybe towards the start of your presentation. I don't know to what extent you, th you think your presentation covered it. Um, how does epistemic diversity contribute to discussions surrounding reproduce research reproducibility and what perspectives from underrepresented groups should be included in shaping future approaches? Sven? <laughs> I think especially the second part, the idea of underrepresented yes, groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can uh, take the question. So, one thing that epistemic diversity can definitely contribute in this respect is this aspect of providing more perspective, but also kind of providing uh, knowledge that might maybe not be available to those people who usually talk about reproducibility, because for them that's their bread and butter, and for people, for example, in the humanities or in uh, other fields or types of research where that is not. A regular occurrence, they might actually also be able to discuss and uh, provide a perspective on different ways of knowing. But also currently, what is quite interesting, what is also happening in this uh, context of epistemic diversity and the drives that is currently happening regarding reproducibility is that fields and researchers who usually are not confronted with this also start to uh, think about this in a sense of whether it fits their research, or how they might be able to make it fit their research, where people, for example, in qualitative research, come up with their own definitions of these terms to see how that might fit and also see how that might not fit. Great. Anything to add on that, Jesper? No, I think fine. No, uh, yeah, and I think especially in the qualitative work that we've done uh, with qualitative researchers on the way that they approach the topic of reproducibility, the need for a, a kind of deeper language where these kind of uh, uh, deeper commonalities might be uh, examined uh, really comes through. So we have another question from Marcel Laflamme. Um, is there a need for more research on epistemic diversity and why it's desirable rather than just a pesky legacy? enough to design around or is this well understood so do we need to know more about the nature of epistemic diversity per se actually uh correct me Spent, if i'm wrong but the notion of epistemic diversity is not that well uh defined uh and uh, if you ask researchers whether there are more research is needed then they will say yes right um uh, but I'm not really sure. I mean, yeah, okay, it's pesky, but uh, we seem to have, again, like uh, with reproducibility, we seem to have a common understanding of this. Uh, and you can actually trace epistemic diversity and issues of that a long way back, uh, especially in uh, in the social sciences. Uh, uh, there's been turf wars around this for, for, for many decades. Would you add something there, Sven? Yeah, I think whether whether epistemic diversity is desirable, I don't know whether I can say something about it, but I think the, the important point here is that epistemic diversity is a reality. And so yeah. if reproducibility is something that should be applied to research, then that research is not just one thing, but actually a multitude of different things, then it should be acknowledged that this reproducibility has to be put in relation to epistemic diversity. And I think something that uh, is might be quite useful in the aspect of epistemic diversity and looking at it is what I previously also said, this aspect of uh, different researchers maybe even being able to learn something from researchers who do research differently uh, because they do it, especially for a different purpose and in different ways. Yeah. But you can also add that this is a huge issue as well in research evaluation, right? Because some kind of, of knowledge production 
modes uh, uh, are benefited uh, uh, in, in, in research ev evaluation, which also has its issues with not acknowledging epistemic diversity. Yes. Uh, I, I think especially from the point of view of reproducibility, we're, we're still just kind of getting past uh, from quite an abstract level in kind of operationalizing this understanding of, of all the different possible meanings of reproducibility across practical contexts. So my answer to Marcel would be, yeah, there's a lot more to understand there. Um, We'll move on. Uh, so Izatu had another couple of questions, uh, which I would come back to if we have time. But we also have a question here from uh, Bart Penders, who I think we all know. Hello, Bart. We, how would your proposal, Schneider, I think that's you, Jesper, uh, fare when it encounters semi-standardized accountability frameworks and quality benchmarks in organizations? This maybe links on to what, exactly what you were just saying about evaluation, I guess. What do you think, Schneider? Uh, I'm, I'm Schneider, yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, quite, to be honest, quite honest, I don't know. Um, Sven, it's your framework too. It's actually Alps and Schneider. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think, so I think that was the point we had with the, with the note that this is the semi-standardized or the moment something becomes standardized, it will inevitably become problematic, not just in that in two ways. One one way is that reproducibility is kind of an evolving concept and an evolving practice, especially when applied to the uh, diversity of research. Uh, and, and the other thing is that research itself is a kind of a dynamic system. It's not static. So in that sense, if you have a standardized system that is used for evaluation or hiring or or quality control, then you always have the risk that it is not adapted to the actual context or purpose or system of research that it is embedded in. Right. And then it's open for a classical sociological analysis about how incentivizing or institutionalizing these things uh, can go astray, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, these conversations are really live at the moment with all the discussion of reform of reward and recognition. And so. Thank you. I, I um, think that is an important point there to make uh, because usually uh, researchers are often have the perception that some of these things becoming semi or fully standardized is something that is brought upon us from the outside. I would argue that that is certainly is not always the case. There is also an uh, 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 and an internal uh, promotion of some of these issues, especially, of course, for those it benefits. Excellent. Okay. Um, so maybe very quickly, uh, um, uh, I see that Martin has a point here. Okay. So this will be the last one. And maybe you could both respond to is it two's other two questions in the chat. So uh, do different knowledge production modes share a common understanding of what it means for research to be uncertain? Or does your framework provide them with a sense of how they could think about this issue in a way that's comparable between different modes of uh, knowledge production? That's a good question. Uh, of course, we have the uncertainty idea from Whitley. Um, he applies it to fields. Um, I think it's an open question whether it, it is actually uh, uh, or how well it works when you break it down uh, to these uh, rather loose construct of knowledge production. I don't know what you would say, Sven. Yeah, I, I think what we try to kind of escape that situation is that the concept or this idea of uncertainty, we want to attach it to the actual practices that are associated with the type of reproducibility. So that the, that the uncertainty is linked to the specific aspects, for example, that have to be redone or the specific aspects that are necessary to enable something in a specific, specific way, like repositories or the... Uh, uh, these kind of things, how 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 much that is um, actually shared. So so and, and uncertainty, of course, is kind of linked to the knowledge production mode because uncertainty is always also a sociological thing in the research community. So kind of whether uh, the certain knowledge about 
the application or about procedures is shared between the person who did the original research and the person who wants to redo it. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks uh, to Jesper and to Sven. Um, so is the two other two questions are there in the chat. Um, if you would have time, maybe uh, you can reply to them uh, directly there. And uh, I will invite uh, my colleague Yuri to take the stage. So Yuri will be presenting uh, uh, work from another aspect of Tier 2, where we uh, used future studies methodologies to work with stakeholders to envis envisage the future. And this is also work which is uh, co-led by Yuri's research assistant, uh, Barbara Leitner, who's not with us today. Uh, Yuri, please. Yeah, thank you so much also for the kind introduction, Tony. Um, uh, is, is, can you see my full screen now? Yeah. Yeah, OK, great. So indeed, my name is Yuri Tidink, and uh, we collaborate together, uh, well, in the whole uh, Tier 2 project. Of course, this is work that we have done together. And this is also the fun of research that you do things together. Um, and we're going to talk about the futures of reproducibility. And, and again, uh, also heads up uh, for uh, some a thumbs up for Barbara for uh, for 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 making this um, and uh, creating this presentation together. And also a uh, uh, big thanks for the Center for Open Science to facilitate this webinar and that we can have discussions and that that's, that we can have these discussions together. And I hope I can be a, a little bit of, um, uh, that that the work that we have done is of inspiration uh, for uh, for the uh, for the participants. So, uh, so the big question, and I, I'm happy that I'm after uh, Schneider because um, uh, it, what is reproducibility? He already gave a lot of different definitions and how difficult it is to give one definitions. So what what uh, at the highest level is just obtaining consistent results when repeating experiments and uh, analysis. And um, it's not only in, in the definition vary a lot, but that's, that's how we have used it in the work that I'm going to present. Uh, and of course, you have different forms of reproducibility, but that's not the, um, the, the, the thing that we're going to discuss today. Um, so what are we going to discuss um, uh, is the work that we've done in the in the tier two project and uh, specifically the future studies. A future study is a specific method that you that you are looking to the future and that you explore po potential possible futures with the aim to create and enable a preferred future. Uh, and it's a qualitative participatory research method. And why would you then employ uh, uh, future studies for it specifically for this topic, reproducibility? So we all know that the discussions on reproducibility are extensive. And, uh, and in the past decade, we have, have had, had a lot of discussions on it, but we don't actually know uh, and this is also one of the things that we try to do in the tier two project. Where are we heading to in these discussions? Where are we going to? And one of the central points in in tier two, which uh, which makes it also very well for, for for from my perspective also very interesting, is that we want to center epistemic diversity so that in different as as Sven, uh, as uh, Jesper said, it's different knowledge production modes. We have different ways how we want to. Mm -hmm look at reproducibility, um, but that we also want to make it applicable to broad this uh, to to uh, uh, to make it applicable for different disciplinary uh, fields. Uh, and the question is, are we actually moving forward? And if we are moving forward, if we move, are we moving in the right direction or do we need some steering uh, towards this uh, direction? Um, so uh, that was also the objective for this, this study. It, 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 uh, we have uh, uh, we want to scope the ideal future of reproducibility for different stakeholders in online workshops, and we wanted to explore roadmaps towards this future, including the enablers and the barriers that might come uh, that might come across when we want to reach those preferred futures. So we use, in what method we use, we use scenario workshops and we use uh, backcasting methods to explore the steps needed for the ideal future of reproducibility. And if we were, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit deeper about what, what are scenario workshops and uh, what are backcasting techniques. 
Um, but if we are there, then we want to explore what are the barriers and the enablers for uh, for 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 reaching those preferred futures. So very briefly on scenario planning. So in the difference between forecast planning and scenario planning is that you uh, uh, you have a basic standpoint and that you plan for multiple futures. And that's something that we did in, the, in, in our work. And the backcasting is also something that we really want to show here uh, why what, what backcasting makes special. Uh, forecasting is when will I get there and how will I, uh, 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 and, 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 and without knowing the end point. Well, if you backcast, then you already know the goal. Uh, just, so you are already at the goal and you can see how you will get there and what obstacles you will 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 might might come across along the way towards this future and doing this ma makes it easier for to identify the uh, the barriers and the enablers and also with this vision of the future uh, in mind it is easier to overcome these barriers for sure so um uh so the the goals then um so, so why so the methods for for this specific uh research is examining the study uh, of the possible probable and undesired and preferred future uh uh maps out the future of the, of the uh problem and then do backwards uh, techniques so what i what we then get is an overview of potential scenarios and then identify the drivers and the barriers towards the desired future thinking at towards the future by mapping backwards so what we did we worked we did online workshops uh, first we did a pilot workshop of uh, reproducibility expert to test our methods and then we did four online workshops working on the Miro board. Some of you may have uh, worked on, uh, on, on Miro boards. It's a very handy way to, to actually work and collaborate together with uh, important stakeholders. So we, we organized four workshops, one for publishers, one for funders, as they are two very important stakeholders uh, pre-identified already in the tier two project, and they play a central role in the tier uh, uh, tier two project as well, both in the uh, creation of um, of tools and practices to to improve uh, reproducibility or to foster reproducibility, but also uh, as participants, but also as as users of the of the materials that we're going to create. Uh, so the publishers, the funders, the qualitative researchers, and the machine learning researchers as uh, two other um, uh, stakeholder uh, categories. And the first exercise was really about, okay, which state, of course, if you want to, if you are picturing the future uh, and, 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 and try to backcast towards this future, then you also need to know what are the important stakeholders. So that was the first exercise of the workshop that we first wanted to identify which stakeholders are the most in influential in shaping the future of reproducibility. And that also gave the opportunity for the participants to uh, to add new stakeholders that we might have overlooked because we identified already already some stakeholders. So that was the first exercise. The second exercise was really about the scenario, uh, uh, the scenario planning, and we asked the participants already before the workshop, but also during the workshop to think and then to uh, to share and then to discuss the four different scenarios. The preferred scenario, that was the, the central uh, aim of the, of the workshop, a dystopian future, a realistic future, and an outlier future of reproducibility in 10 years' time. So we really focused on, okay, how should reproducibility look like in 2033? Uh, and based on these discussions we uh, end up with four themes uh, were identified uh, as crucial and I'll come back to that in a minute but on the right side you see how such a uh, well in, in very in, in very brief how this how this looks like on on the mirror board and then the third one is the backcasting uh, uh, that that I already briefly described is that okay based on this preferred future we ask them okay so, okay take one part of this preferred future in mind and then uh, just to develop a concrete goal and then 
work backwards from that future goal to the present to identify the barriers and the drivers between these two time points. So 10 years ahead in time, that was the goal and the, the present or the now. Um, and then place that in the timeline. And this is how it looks like. Of course, you go to a vision 10 years ahead and then you start working backwards, uh, identifying enablers and barriers to come to this goal. And this is how it looks like uh, on the uh, um, uh, uh, on the on the mirror board. Um, so, in so uh, uh, when we use this this snake in order to to describe the goal and to uh, move back to the present. So then the results. So if you look at the stakeholder mapping, is there someone to blame? Well, that's uh, that is uh, funnily posed, of course. But what? Uh, who is responsible for reproducibility. So all participants from the different stakeholder groups, they said, well, the researchers are the central a point in, in reproducibility or reproducibility discussions. They should play a major role. But they also said that the funders and the publishers also have a very significant role in, in fostering reproducibility in, uh, in different epistemic contexts. And this is something that you can see here uh, quite well. Um, so that was the first exercise. Then we go to the second exercise, though, that was de describing the preferred futures, right? And I, for the sake of time and for the sake of uh, of, of this uh, this uh, presentation, I highlight the four main topics that came out of what is important for the in this preferred future. The first one, and this this is not completely illogical, uh, certainly not uh, if you have the pyramid of of culture change in mind that that was uh, that we we often use, and I'll come back to that and the at the end. The first one is research culture. So a culture is extremely important if you want to uh, 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 the, if you want to foster reproducibility on a departmental level, but also in funders and also in publishers. Um, and in this preferred future, then reproducibility is the new norm. Uh, early career research are introduced during their master's and PhD in, in reproducibility and replication studies. And uh, uh, public main trust, uh, maintain trust in science. So that was the first the research culture. The second one is definitions. The, the second topic was definitions and standardization concerning reproducibility. So, what the participants said, well, in 10 years time, there is a solid definition of reproducibility when, with enough adaptability to account for differences in disciplines and methodologies. Uh, and definitions and standards are used and applied by funders, journals, and conferences. The third topic that, that came out was the guidelines in infrastructure and policy. So public infrastructures are available and usable for data sharing and analysis. And there are clear guidelines that are available for what is required from researchers in different epistemic contexts. And then the fourth, of course, also a very important one. Also, if you take the, the, uh, the, the culture change pyramid in mind, the incentives and the costs. Right. So the recognition of different stakeholders, uh, uh, reproducible actions and practices are, are recognized and made visible. And researchers are rewarded for alternative research outputs and increased opportunity for collaboration, of course, in, if you if you look at reproducibility. Well, apart this was all about the preferred future and we centralized the preferred future in our work because uh, we find that the most important and that was also that we wanted to uh, to highlight because we wanted to know where are we heading to what is this preferred future from different stakeholders perspective but we also acquired some uh, some uh, knowledge on other scenarios like the dystopian future how would that look like and for the sake of time i think it's better that I, I i i'm not going into this but please if you have any questions at the end uh, or if you look back if you see this uh, the the slides uh, later after the um, the webinar you can you can uh, always uh, reach out to us so we have a dystopian future we have an outlier future for example with uh that uh, in the end, there will be a no in 10 years time, there will be a Nobel Prize for reproducibility. That was one of those outlier scenarios that came out. Um, so 
that was uh, in a nutshell the results of the uh, of the second exercise in the workshops then we we go to the third exercise and that was the backcasting results right so what we asked the participants okay giving this preferred future have that in mind take one specific goal of this preferred future and then use backcasting techniques uh, in order to how to reach to this goal so just a couple of results I, I would like to highlight uh, here is that uh, machine learning researchers said that everyone in the research community agree on what makes research reproducible, including the availability of standard resources like templates for publishing, detailing of data sets, methodologies, which uh, states can be achieved and cannot be achieved by following the procedure. So that was one of their goals and they highlighted the different enablers and barriers to actually come to this goal. So from a qualitative researcher perspective, it's different, right? So it, which is uh, which is probably a different knowledge production model. So researchers are ready to share their data due to a multitude of examples across qualitative research approaches, including guidelines and infrastructure that makes it easy to share data. Um, that was one specific goal. Uh, and the publishers say, uh, uh, um, goal was for every research output, there is a complete knowledge graph, including data provenance, forward linking, etc., helping the reader navigate to any information related to reproducibility. Um, also a very interesting preferred future from a publisher perspective. And then the fourth one is from a funder's uh, perspective, also interesting in 10 years time. So PhD candidates receive more funding for their projects to engage in reproducibility practices in their work. And it's also mandatory for PhD candidates to conduct a replication study within their studies and to include it as a chapter for their thesis. So the reproducibility of their work will be reviewed before they can graduate. And uh, researchers that are that that are uh, that are engaged in reproducibility but only in the researchers that are engaged in reproducibility practice, uh, practices get tenure position. So um, having uh, having uh, these these goals for the backcasting exercise here you can also see what are the drivers for it to to reach these goals. It's about um, uh, research. Uh, it's uh, about the driver is a positive research culture where reproducibility is understood and implemented and there's a shared understanding. There are tools and system and platforms for reproducibility practices. There is, of course, training for early career researchers. There are uh, there's policy to drive the best practices and there's also uh, uh, funding for uh, reproducibility and uh, reproducible practices. And what are then the barriers? Of course, culture and social issues like lack of consensus, current incentive push research to val value the wrong things, risk of more bo uh, uh, box ticking exercises, epistemic diversity, uh, the systems that is, can be a lack of support, inequality in available researchers can be a, a, a barrier, of course, lack of rules and standards can be a barrier, um, lack of alignment in the different policies. So. All types of barriers are are described here, and as and here as I as I already alluded to, uh, these uh, this is the uh, we 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 always call it the nose pyramid, and I think a lot of us already calling this, and we are uh, in the tier two project. We uh, uh, one of our colleagues is doing wonderful work on this, how to make this research culture change pyramid more into practice from a behavioral perspective. Um, uh, and um, I'm just highlighting this because here you also see that in the barriers and the enablers, policies, incentives, community skills and tools are constantly coming back as potential, as, as important factor to actually come to this goal, this preferred future. So how and this is of course I, I i really find these questions very important so how can these results from the future study move the field forward so are tools effective enough to fit the preferred future reproducibility for example this is a question that we have in the tier two project we because we are creating tools in order to improve or to foster reproducibility in different stakeholder categories how helpful is the epistemic diversity element um and the identified drivers and barriers influence the implementation of tools. 
So uh, for the um, for the discussion that I would like to have now at the um, uh, in this webinar, I'm I'm happy to hear what do you learn from these futures? Uh, how can it help you in your work as a researcher? And what can help the community to foster reproducibility if you ha have these goals and these futures in mind? So uh, thank you so much for attention. A specific thanks to the whole team. Of course, this is again, uh, it's teamwork. We do these um, these uh, workshops together, not only Barbara and I, but, uh, but a full team, including Tony is uh, involved uh, uh, to, uh, uh, so I, I will also uh, acknowledge that. And thank you so much. And I have, I have to I look forward to, uh, to, uh, to the discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Yuri. Um, so we have about eight minutes um, to ensure that we uh, close the webinar on time. Um, I see a question from uh, uh, Joachim Philipson. Um, to what extent do you think epistemic diversities and different understandings of reproducibility constitute an obstacle to cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary research? or uh, knowledge um, export in terms of discovery of relevant scientific results, outputs in other domains. I think maybe this leads, uh, uh, it's also a question for, for Jesper and Sven. I don't know if you have any reflections on this, Yuri. Yeah, I think it's a very important one. I think uh, if you, if, for example, if you looked at, about the big differences between qualitative researchers on the one hand and and about their preferred futures, and the the machine learning researchers on the other hand, who have way more quantitative approach in doing research, is uh, I think that is 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 interesting. And if they collaborate, I only think. I, I I see it from a more researcher perspective, uh, methodology uh, met methodology perspective as as uh, insightful that you that you actually see the other perspectives because maybe I'm, I'm I, I, and that's so important in the discussions that that are out there for already ten years is that we sometimes forget that there are other perspectives, right? So, uh, for example, in the humanities discussion on the, uh, on reproducibility or replication, I, I really, I sometimes feel that the, that people from biomedicine, they cannot see how different, how different, how different the methods are sometimes in, in the, huma the humanities applied, whilst other parts of the humanities apply different methods, of course. While, on the other hand, well, biomedicine is completely different than than the humanities. So they 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 of course they have another dis a, di a, a, a different perspective on, on reproducibility. Um, but still, well, having said this, um, maybe Jesper would like to add here. Well, uh, as I tried to say, I, I don't think well. From my perspective, I, I don't think it, it, it necessarily boils down to uh, methods uh, or actually this is, is this two-tier thing. First, of, first and foremost, it's about relevance, right? You need to figure out whether this is actually a relevant epistemic norm. And that ties to, uh, to uh, let's say, your, your epistemological uh, stance or position, which is, uh, of course, most... Uh, varied in the social sciences and the so-called humanities, which is actually a very broad term for many different fields. And if you're a positivist, in a sense, it doesn't really matter whether you do quantitative or qualitative studies, then I would say something like redoing or reproducibility or whatever we define it will at some point have an epistemic value for you. The question is then, how feasible is it for you to actually strive for it. And there you run into the problems that ex people who are doing experimental research have some uh, some edges on, on you, but again, there you have uh, also variations. And their methods uh, will certainly play a role because uh, certain ways of, of doing research makes it less feasible to actually uh, sort of comply to these uh, ep epistemic norms. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so another question uh, from Bart Penders, Yuri. <laughs> I like this. 
yeah. how it's could a typical our Bart Bender's question? I think it's a how could our efforts to avoid the dystopian future neg this is like uh, Back to the Future too. I think how could yeah. our efforts to avoid the dystopian future negatively influence our path to the utopian futures? Do we overcompensate in our policies or infrastructures guidelines? But also, why do we need to settle on one future if we can have many? If we can have a multiverse of reproducibility, why do we need? Yeah, that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yuri, please reflect. <laughs> okay, so those are two different questions, I think. Right? How how could our efforts to avoid the dystopian future? I think. Um, so, I'm not. I'm not sure if uh, it's. It's. I think what the what the main thing here is that if you have a preferred future, then you know where you want to move to. And I thought well, and I come back to the the question about that that we have many. I I really like that, so I will come, I will park that. I'll come back. To it. But for now, I really think that having a preferred future from the different stakeholder perspective, because that's also important. A funder has a completely different uh, idea about the um, the preferred future than a um, qualitative researcher, for sure. But I think that knowing where you want to move can really help your efforts to uh, to improve it right so i think that for for us as people really in in doing research on research or meta research um i i think it's it's very important that we can steer a little bit the discussion uh so that's why i think those preferred futures are so uh, important and dystopian futures knowing the dystopian futures can can actually exactly what you describe if you know what what dystopian is then you can also try to avoid it um and and thus try to influence the path the future of reproducibility a bit um and overcompensating in our policies well i think if we if we if we are not too stringent on this and that we um uh, that we that that like like yeah like jesper said beautifully i mean it's it's really about relevance also in this case so for some it, it even in biomedicine you have you have so many differences in uh, how you can produce knowledge right and whether it's re uh, relevant or not so so that's uh, having said that uh, i think you should always be flexible in that regard then the second question uh why do we need to settle for one uh, you're totally right and this is also what actually happens in these workshops um because we ask them okay this is a this is a preferred future uh what is it and then people come up with okay it's this it's that it's this and it's that there are different things so they, they, it is already a multitude of future and then we ask them okay pick one thing one goal uh uh to this uh to uh, to a, a future and then see how you can get to this future uh and which is only one part and that's why we ask them to have different back assing exercises for different goals and I totally agree. You need many, and there's not a, a single one. There's not a single preferred future. Fantastic. Thanks for these uh, remarks, Yuri. With this, um, uh, uh, for the sake of our uh, hosts, uh, Center for Open Science, and our um, attendees who maybe have another meeting to get to, we're going to finish very punctually on time. So. Um, I would just obviously like to thank Yuri, Jesper, as well as uh, Sven for contributing today. Uh, on behalf of the Tier 2 project, I'd really like to thank everybody for your attendance. Please watch out uh, uh, our website for updates on this work. There are lots of papers in process from all of this work and much, much more. And we'll have many more results coming out as well. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank um, our hosts, uh, the Center for Open Science, for giving us the chance to share our work today. So with that, uh, many thanks and have a great day, great week, great year. Bye.